All right, ladies and gentlemen, you are locked on Falcons. I'm your host, Aaron Freeman. And today I am joined by Pewter Reports' John Ledyard to break down the top edge rushers in this 2022 draft class. John's going to tell us who's overrated, who's underrated, and which one of these guys should they land in Atlanta uh, will give the most problems for the team that he covers, which is the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. You are Locked On Falcons, your daily Atlanta Falcons podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. So guys, you know me, I'm Aaron Freeman, been covering the Falcons for many years, formerly at Falcfans.com, RIP, still going strong on Twitter, at Falcfans, and of course, the host of this illustrious Locked On Falcons podcast or daily Atlanta Falcons podcast right here on the Locked On Sports Atlanta podcast family. And I want to thank everyone that makes Locked On Falcons their first listen each and every day. Of course, Locked On Falcons is free and available on a variety of podcast platforms, including Apple, Odyssey, Google, Spotify, and now on YouTube. Make sure you subscribe to the Locked On Falcons YouTube channel and you'll get the video version of the podcast the night before the audio version drops. So today's episode will be joined a little bit later by John Ledyard of Pewter Report. John's been a frequent guest on the Locked On Falcons podcast, specializing in pass rushers. Uh, He's come on in the past, formerly of Locked On NFL Draft many years ago, back when I also first started out at the network, also one of the founding members of the Draft Network, and of course now covering the Tampa Bay Buccaneers over at Pewter Report. And we'll get John's thoughts on some of these top pass rushers, particularly those are the guys that could be potentially on on the Falcons' radar at the top of round one, but also getting some thoughts on some of the guys that if the Falcons go in another direction with that first uh, round pick, you know, some of the other top edge rushers that they may be able to get a little bit later in the draft on days two and three. And we'll get into that conversation with John Ledger right now. All right, guys, you are locked on Falcons. I'm, of course, your host, Aaron Freeman. And today I am joined by John Ledyard, who covers the Tampa Bay Buccaneers for Pewter Report. He's one of the founding members of the Draft Network and many years ago was the co-host of the Locked On NFL Draft podcast. John is my go-to guy to talk about edge rushers, and he often appears here on Locked On Falcons to talk about that very subject because every stinking year the Falcons need edge rushers and they simply <laughs> refuse to draft good ones. So we have we've, we've got some meeting like this, Aaron. <laughs> like every year we we got to do this because they still don't have any pass rushers. So it, you know we're just going to keep having John on the podcast telling us here are the edge rushers that the Falcons should draft and they will refuse to draft them and we'll do that again <laughs> today. But John, welcome back uh, to Locked On Falcons. No, absolutely. Thanks for having me, man. It is funny. I laugh because it does feel like there's some draft. You've been doing the draft stuff long enough. I've been doing it long enough that now I feel like when I come on these shows every year before the draft, I was just on a Jets show and I realized while I was in the middle of it, I was like, they're asking the same questions last year because this team, again, like the Falcons, they never draft pass rushers. So, or they don't draft good ones. Like they got to, you know, draft them again. So it is funny. Like I come on. This show and Jets shows and Falcons every year just talk about edge rushers because teams always need them. So maybe this will be the year it changes. They're a great edge class and they certainly have some picks. So it's going to be fun to see how it shakes out. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. And, you know, they're picking at eight. Seems like a prime spot to get one of these top flight edge rushers. A lot of people expect a bunch of guys to go in the first round. Seeming like most people are projecting at least five, if not seven of these edges to go in round one, and they are Aiden Hutchinson, Trayvon Walker, Kayvon Thibodeau, uh, Jermaine Johnson, George Karlaftis, Boye Mafe, Arnold Evichetti are, are guys that may sneak into the back end of round one. Do you sort of agree that all of these guys are deserving of being picked that high? And if you're sort of building your own draft board and stacking these edge rushes, sort of how would you order those guys at the top? Well, Karlaftis is the one guy I would say that I can't really make a case for being a first round pick personally will he be one maybe um and i think it'll be at the end of the first round if he is one but it's possible that he is i just can't quite get there with him you know i some my grading scale works like a little bit differently than the actual draft works so like if i have a second round grade in a player 
it's like a team with build their board. Doesn't necessarily mean they won't take that player in the first round because teams and, and I do, myself do not have 32 first round graded players any year. So because of that, you end up taking some players with second round grades. It's more like a level of valuation. So when you look at your board and say, oh, okay, all the players we have graded in the first round are gone. Now here's what we have left of our second round grades. We're picking it, you know, wherever you're picking for the Falcons at eight that, you know, there should be some first round grades you would think left still on their board by the time they pick. But if it was a team later, like where the Bucks pick, for example, 27, you're like, okay, who are the players we have valued in the second round? As, as you know, for me, that would mean like, we think they're going to be good starters. There might not be an all pro or a pro bowl ceiling, but like they could be very good starters uh, for the majority of their career, um, reliable starters in that way. So that's kind of how I see it. And as long as you hit that criteria, usually I'm okay with you being what will end up being a first round pick. But Carl Loftus is a guy of the names you mentioned, I couldn't get there with him. Um, I think that there's going to be some issues with his game converting to the NFL just in terms of his stance really allows him pre-snap to kind of cheat things and corner a little bit easier. But when you actually, when he has to kind of rush more square, he kind of has this open stance when he rushes that kind of angles him right toward the pocket. And it was very hard for tackles to adjust their pass sets to how, to where the angles that he would take, especially when he could jump the snap. Um, and then once he faced teams that schematically kind of knew what he was going to do toward the end of the year, there was like Ohio state was an example. Like they knew exactly how to, to how to block him and how to defend him, you know, to keep him from getting, being disruptive. And they ran inside of him and his stance kind of allowed him to get kicked out. And then when he was jumping down the line of scrimmage, they ran outside of him and the key quarterback pulled the ball or they, they just found lots of ways to take advantage of him in space and put him in, in that space that he likes to play in and kind of, get him off his, his level of comfort as just being a pure speed rusher, um, speed to power rusher, that, those kind of things. And so I, I think there's too many limitations with him for me to feel good about him in the first round. I think he'll be a valuable player in terms of his role, but as a full-time player in the NFL, I don't know if I see that ceiling for him or some of these other guys, like even a Trayvon Walker who I'm lower on I, I than most, you know, I have him at the early third round grade for me. Um, you know, so that means I would see him being like a solid starter in the NFL. I think he'll be, somebody who can start and hold the line defensively in terms of run defense. But I don't know that I see this pass rush athleticism. Obviously it's great natural athleticism. You could see that, but pass rush athleticism, I've probably talked about it before on the show with you, but the, the pillars of pass rush athleticism that I look like in terms of number one would be burst off the ball. Number two would be like speed up the arc to continue that, that burst that you had off the ball you know, to really threaten the edge four or three would be like that bend and flexibility. There's a couple different ways to achieve that, but I would say that bend and flexibility, able to get your body turned to the pocket and being able to threaten on that outside angle and not just get pushed up the arc every time. And then four would be change of direction. Can you come back inside? Can you stop, start? Can you get up the arc and then come back inside, cross the tackle's face and get inside of him for pressure? That would be where I say, you know, Walker, I don't know. He's just really unproven in all those areas pretty much. Like he doesn't really show much on tape in any of those areas. You know, he's probably going to be explosive once he figures out coming off the ball, but the rest of it is still a little bit up in the air with him. So those would be the two guys I'd hesitate on. Walker's obviously going to be a top five pick. I think everybody kind of knows that now. He's probably going to be a top two pick, and he could be the number one overall pick in the draft, which would be wild, Aaron. Can you remember a first-round pick with as many just total question marks uh, as, as a Trayvon Walker would be? It speaks to this class in a lot of ways, but also teams just willing to sell their soul for athleticism uh, on the defensive line. It is so important to be athletic up there. And, and that's why I understand Walker being in the first round. I would get it. And especially with the intangibles that I think he checks for teams that from what I've heard in the interview process, I would get drafting him in the first round. A Jabo with his injury, probably not a risk I would take necessarily, but um, you know, I would understand based on some of the traits there. But for me, the only guys that had true first round grades on were Kayvon Thibodeau and and Aiden Hutchinson. And I would take, you know, those guys high as long as the other stuff checked out with them. But the rest of them I would take probably within the top 32 picks. I just don't see quite the same ceiling for the rest of the class. So, guys, we're going to continue today's conversation with John Ledger to Pewter Report and get into some of the players that John feels may create most of the bigger headaches for the Buccaneers should the Falcons wind up drafting them. But before we get there, guys, I do want to plug the Locked On Sports Atlanta podcast family. Uh, in addition to daily shows like Locked On Falcons and Locked On Hawks and Locked On Braves, of course, you also have a separate feed and brand new feed 
called Locked On Sports Atlanta on all the same podcast platforms. You can find Locked On Falcons and you get three shows A to Z with Mark Zeno hit, hitting hard with John Chuckery and ATL Day Ones with Jarvis Davis and Tanitra Batiste. And if you go check out A to Z right now on Thursday's episode, you'll find me talking about the Falcons first round pick. And Friday, if you check out uh, ATL Day Ones, you'll also find me on that podcast as well with Tanitra and Jarvis. So if you've been reluctant or hesitant to check out Locked On Sports Atlanta on its own podcast feed on YouTube as well as on your preferred audio platform, uh, by all means, today and tomorrow are certainly the best days to do so. Uh, But let's continue today's episode talking a little bit about some of the things that you guys can get into uh, this weekend um, after you check out Locked On Sports Atlanta, and it's a great weekend to head on over to betonline.net and get started if you haven't started already. BetOnline is, of course, the number one source for all your sports betting needs and info. This weekend, you got Braves versus Padres. You got Hawks and Cavs in a play-in game, and of course, BetOnline covered, has you covered in those uh, two sports and those two matchups for the latest odds contests and player props. Uh, and it's not just Major League Baseball or the NBA. BetOnline also has you covered for boxing, UFC, golf, hockey, esports, your favorite Vegas casino games. And of course, they got you covered for your top 2022 NFL draft props. How many receivers are going to go in round one? Who's going to be the number one pick? And of course, you can take the over under on where players like Jermaine Johnson, Kayvon Thibodeau, and Trayvon Walker will be selected. You can find it all by heading over to the website today at betterline.net. Betterline, where the game starts. Now, you're talking with John Ledger of, of Pewter Report, talking about these edges. You mentioned Kayvon Thibodeau and, and Aiden Hutchinson being uh, sort of the, the premier guys, on, at least on your draft board. Uh, I, I ask you, as someone who covers the Bucs, um, and, uh, you know, I guess my question is, who would you be if the Falcons, you know, pulled the trigger on drafting one of these edge rushers? You would sit here and go, oh, man, this guy is going to create so many headaches for the Bucks for the next, you know, mm. seven to 10 years or whatever. Who's that guy that you would basically, uh, as someone who covers the Bucks, don't want to necessarily see twice a year? With Thibodeau, there's all these conversations about off the field and work ethic and how much he cares and all this stuff. And I really, you know, this from the past there, and I don't really get into all that stuff. I don't know him. I've certainly talked to people just because that's the nature of the business. All the same things that are out there. And then some, you know, I, I've heard people's opinions on it. It doesn't sound like he's a bad kid or anything like that. There's just a lot of wonder of how much he'll be focused on football and will he work hard? Will he try hard? Will he play hard? Will he practice hard? Will he train hard in the offseason? All those questions. I get why teams have to ask him. I'm not one of those people that thinks like all this off the field conversation every time it comes up is, is stupid and wrong. I, I'm not saying that either. I just saying I can't speak to it. Like I don't. I don't have first-hand knowledge of them, and I would hate for somebody without first-hand knowledge of me to be talking about my character from what they heard from other people. So, you know, I, I, my biggest thing is just trying to evaluate them on the field and try to evaluate the athletic testing and the production. Those are the three things I really spend time looking at, and teams can figure out all the rest of the stuff that I don't have access to or insight into. So with that in mind, Thibodeau is the player that on the field, you know, I felt like on the field what he offers, especially if he can continue to develop, his ceiling is just like it's so threatening as a rusher. You know, when you talk about those pillars of athleticism I was talking about, of pass rush athleticism, he's just very functional in that way. Like one of the most explosive players off the ball I've ever watched. And, you know, the most important characteristic for anybody who plays defensive line is to be first off the ball. If you're first off the ball and you're consistently first off the ball, you are going to find ways to make plays. Like you don't even have to have a perfect game you are going to find ways to make plays because you were the first guy moving. So already what the other person has to do across from you is changed. Like their dynamic has changed because you're winning off the ball that consistently, especially relative to other players of your position. He's just so consistently explosive. It's, it's, it's jaw dropping how fast he is off the ball. And then he obviously has the speed to continue that. And he has good bend and flexibility at the top of the arc. So there's traits there that just are salivating for a pass rusher. Like he, he just has, a lot of tools in his kit to work with, but there's also a lot of need for development. So he would need to be in a good situation. He would need great coaching and he would need to be responsive to that coaching because, you know, there, he's not a bad run defender, but you know, teams will find a way to, to take him out of the game as a run defender. And he has to find more ways to get to the quarterback. You know, great tackles are going to handle him with ease unless he finds more 
ways to get to the quarterback. Can you cross the face? Can you come back inside more consistently? Right now, there's no semblance of a power rush really with him. He's got to be able to be more effective with his hands. So there are questions for sure, but what he can do well is very, very difficult to find. So I would value that a lot. Hutchinson is almost certainly going to be a really good player and certainly you wouldn't want to face him if you're an opposing team. He's going to be very tough. He's going to be relentless. You know, even if he doesn't one-on-one win his way to 15 sacks a year, he will probably hustle and and keep moving and create enough pressure um, to to be really disruptive on the level of like a 15 sack guy um, each year. So he will be an impact player in the NFL. So both of those guys, I would say, you know, from the Bucks perspective, they'd love to see them off the board by the time the Falcons pick. Uh, we'll feel out how that goes, obviously. There isn't anybody else in the edge rusher class that I would just be terrified of right now or scared of, but there's certainly other good players that would certainly boost the units that are in Atlanta, I think, if they were to acquire them. Well, I want to ask about another one of those players, Jermaine Johnson, who's often mocked to the Falcons just because a lot of people think guys like Hutchinson and Walker and Thibodeau could wind up all being sort of top five picks. And a lot of people have Johnson as that next guy had a really strong senior bowl, uh, several years of, of lack of production as a Juco guy going to Georgia as a backup, but then transferred to Florida state this past year. And we saw his production explode. Uh, what are your thoughts on, on Jermaine Johnson, sort of what he brings to the table, not only from a floor perspective coming into the NFL, but what do you sort of see his potential ceiling? Yeah, I think he is probably one of the hardest players in this class. Just plays so hard, like just so physical, so aggressive, nonstop motor. But unlike some of the other guys in the D-line, like he's not just a bull in a china shop and kind of out of control. He plays very hard, very aggressive, but very under control. So he's not running himself out of a lot of plays or getting out of his gap. He plays assignment, sound ball. The combination of those two things right away coming out of college is pretty rare, especially for a guy who – really just played this past season. I mean, he played a little bit at Georgia before, but when he transferred, you know, this was his first season as a full starter and he responded with great production. Um, he's very physical just in terms of when he gets his hands on linemen or as a tackler. I mean, he he is out there. Uh, he told me he wants to put people on their back. That's what he told me at the Senior Bowl, and that's how he plays. That's how he played at the Senior Bowl. It was just so obvious from the first day he was the best player out there. Like, it was just that obvious. He was just so explosive and violent. Um, now he is a little bit stiff and I think he will have some issues as a pure corner bender in the NFL. So that could present him issues and that could limit the ceiling some as a pass rusher, but he's explosive enough off the ball and fast enough that I still think he's going to be edge. What he has to keep doing better and he has to keep being able to come back inside, win with counter moves, be able to forklift guys. He plays with a low pad level. That needs to be a big strength of his to be able to long arm and he has to kind of work a very versatile pass rush game. He will have probably some of the same limitations as Montez Sweat had coming out in terms of just not being very bendy or able to corner at the highest level. Um, but I think there's enough there with Johnson, even more so than Sweat, um, to be able to do that and threaten that way enough to be able to then get back inside and, and take it. He has to win on all three levels. He has to be able to go outside, inside, and through tackles to a degree in order to match potential as a rusher. So that probably won't happen year one, but he'll grow into that hopefully by year three. And in year one, you're, you're going to get a run defender. You're going to get somebody who's ready to play very physical, very strong. Uh, there's just a lot to work with there already in year one. And then the ceiling on top of that is pretty high. So high floor, high ceiling guy. He would be my number three edge rusher. I really like him. And you know, he'd make the Falcons better for sure. Even if it didn't happen right away, their timeline might be a couple of years down the road anyway. So, guys, we got more to come on today's Locked On Falcons episode, and we'll get some thoughts on which of this sort of day two and day three options uh, make sense for a team like the Falcons looking to enhance their pass rush. Some guys that they could, uh, you know, have a low risk, high reward. I don't know if that's the right way of describing middle and, and later round picks uh, in this regard, but we'll get John's thoughts on that as we continue today's episode. Uh, but before we get there, guys, I do want to talk about, you know, the ongoing draft coverage that we have here on the Lockdown Podcast Network, obviously culminating in three days of live coverage on the Locked On NFL Draft live show, uh, which you can find on all the podcast platforms, of course, beginning Thursday night on April 
28th and to get you primed for the pump uh next week we are kicking off our ultimate mock draft that annual tradition where all the locked on hosts uh get together and select for their respective teams who they think their teams should be taking not necessarily who they think they will be taking but ultimately who they will take you know we'll have you covered there as well when we get to that live show on april 28th through april 30th and of course the locked on ultimate mock draft uh, begins on Odyssey and other podcast platforms on April 18th and runs through the next week. And guys, you know, got to ask you, who doesn't love peanut butter and chocolate, right? And if you're a big fan of peanut butter and chocolate, then you got to check out the peanut butter flavor over at Built Bar. And Built Bar is, of course, the protein bar that tastes just like a candy bar, even better than a candy bar because Built Bars not only taste good, they're good for you, low in sugar, low in calories, low in carbs, but high in protein high in fiber, and whether it's the peanut butter flavor uh, or the yellow chirps flavor that you want to get just uh, in time for Easter, or you just want to wake up to a nice, healthy blueberry muffin first thing in the morning, or you want to indulge in a great dessert like raspberry cheesecake, or you're just a big fan of salted caramel or coconut almond, whatever it is, Built Bar has you covered. They got what you want. They got what you need. And you can find it all by heading over to Built.com. Use the promo code LOCKED15. You'll get 15% off your order. Again, that's promo code LOCKED15 for 15% off at Built.com. Um, talking here with John Ledyard, wrapping up, uh, talking about some of these edge rushers. We've already talked about some of the guys that could be options for the Falcons at eight. Let's talk a little bit about maybe some guys should the Falcons go in another direction. You see a lot of mock drafts have Falcons going wide receiver in the first round. I know me personally, I think there's a very good chance they may take a quarterback if the right guy is there at that eighth overall selection and may have to do the thing that they've been doing too often uh, these last couple of years and punting on one of these high end edge rushers and maybe settling for a a lesser player on day two. Who are some of the guys that are sort of day two standouts um, that are getting those second, third round grades from you um, that are also being projected to go in that range by NFL teams? I think there's a couple guys that could be options for them. Ajabo, obviously, with his injury um, from Michigan, he's a guy that has very, when he gets off the ball right. And again, it's it's not consistent. It's kind of like Hutchinson early in the year. Neither of them were consistently getting off the ball at the same time. Hutchinson kind of figured it out later in the year, cut down on some of the false stepping that he was doing and became a way more explosive player um, as a result. It was a huge difference for him. Ajabo still hasn't quite figured it out. You know, when he's able to time up snaps and get off the ball, it's pretty awesome. Um, he can really explode. There's a little bit of Bud Dupree in him, maybe like a little bit of a combination of Bud Dupree and Yannick and Gakwe. Like Bud was probably a better run defender, just was bigger, stronger, thicker guy, or developed into a better one. But it took Bud a couple of years to get ready in the NFL. Like he was a hit or miss player early on in his career, and honestly, going into the year four, even looked like he was probably going to be a bust. And and you know, some people would still describe him that way. You know, he had some a couple of good years toward the end in Pittsburgh, then was hurt a lot at two different times. So Jabo kind of reminds me in some ways explosive off the line of scrimmage, but not super bendy. Um, Jabo might be a little bit further along with his rush plan. Bud was as raw as it gets coming out. Jabo's not raw, but they're probably going to have to win in similar ways. Like they probably have to be really good with their hands to be able to trim edges and things like that, um, to be able to use power moves. Um, Ajabo's kind of an upright player. So if he wants to be at his best in the NFL, Got to drop the pads, probably has to get a little bit stronger to be an every down player. I still think there's like a kind of a trajectory for a Jabo to reach his ceiling. I don't think it'll take four years like Bud um, and his ceiling is probably higher if he gets there. Um, we'll see. The injury really, you know, people will say, oh, he probably wasn't going to be a big impact player anyway because uh, of you know how you know, he's a little bit a little bit raw. I don't think he's super raw, but a little bit raw. He probably wasn't going to be like a full-time starter anyway if you drafted him. Yeah, but now his development's a year behind, and he has to develop off an injury, and he can't develop his skill set. Um, so it's actually more concerning for me than other players. And then Achilles is not another injury. Achilles is a different story. The whole situation absolutely sucks for him because, uh, it, again, it's like a situation that you just – for a player like that, you really don't want to see anything like that happen because he needs to be on the field and he needs to be, be practicing and honing his craft. And now that's not going to – that process isn't going to happen with him probably for another year. So – I would have some level of concern with that. Um, Abakite is another player. I don't know. Maybe that's high for him. I mean, I'm trying to think the Falcons could probably, he might be there at 58 for them. You know, there's a couple different options for somebody like Abakite, I think. Um, 
just a really natural player. He kind of reminds me of Shaq Barrett in a lot of ways, honestly. Um, it probably he tests more athletic than Shaq Barrett. Uh, I don't think he necessarily plays super athletic, but he's just crafty. He knows how to rush. Period. He just knows how to rush. He knows how to use his hands. Knows how to get his hips around. Um, he just gets it. Uh, he's not this super twitched up guy. If he was, we'd be talking about him more in the first round. I think most people think he'll go in the second round. Um, the drawback with him is that he's not a great run defender right now. He tries hard. He plays hard. He's just not that big, not that strong. So as a run defender, you're probably going to leave something to be desired where Shaq Barrett's a really good run defender. So that's where the comparison there falls apart a little bit, but I do like him just in terms of pass rush juice, early impact. He just seems kind of pro ready in his approach in that way. Um, and then boy, Mafe is probably the other one. Uh, I really like Mafe. He was used kind of oddly by Minnesota. You saw him like head up over the tackle, and sometimes he's in a square stance on the end of the line of scrimmage. You didn't always see his athleticism on display, but when it was, it was pretty cool Like to see a guy his size be able to burst and bend the way that he does. Again, there's just awesome upside there. He needs development, but he works hard. He's physical. He got better at the Senior Bowl. Everybody was talking about him, how much better he looked in the Senior Bowl than even his tape. I think some of it's usage, and I think some of it he'll be a lot better player in the NFL where they pass more and he's allowed to just kind of tee off a little bit more. Um, he could brush inside, outside maybe. He's athletic enough to stand up from a two-point stance, even though he's huge, and maybe he dropped a little bit at Minnesota. He could drop some. I, I think there's just a lot there to work with as a player, and his mindset seems to be the type of player you'd want to be able to develop. So he's not the most instinctive guy right now. Maybe that never changes. Um, there's enough flashes for me to buy into him. So those are probably the three guys I would say early in the second round that you'd want to keep your eye on if they're there. Any other sort of uh, mid to late round sleepers that you got your eyes on that you do you really like? You know, there's some guys that just I'm not really totally sure what to make of them yet, but there's like Drake Jackson from USC. He could be a total bust or he could hit if he d develops his body and his technique. There are like reps with him just exploding and kind of dipping that are just, again, these are the things that you can't get in most classes. And then this class has a couple guys like that. And if you can work out the rest of the stuff, you really have something like guys who can just create space on their own as pass rushers and don't need, you know, a bunch of good fortune basically to get production and just can win one-on-one, -on -one, even if they're liabilities for 10 other snaps a game, the one snap they might win could be one that wins you the game. Cause it could be a sack ends a drive, could be a strip, could take people team out of field goal range could change the play calling progression from that point on. Those are just such valuable players. So yeah, guys like Drake Jackson, who I haven't even fully finished an evaluation on, um, you know, even to some degree guys like Sam Williams, who you know total liability in the run game right now, um, but has a lot of traits that are worth developing. Like you have to measure inside your organization. Like, do we have people that can develop these guys and, and, or is this going to be a wasted pick? And then you have to also be able to have sat down with the player and say, he's all in on football. I know it's not a full game isn't there yet, but we fully believe this is the guy that's going to commit himself to becoming a well-rounded player enough to see the field for us by, you know, year two, year three, in a full-time capacity. So those are the things teams have to figure out. If those are things are true, though, of teams and they feel like they check both those boxes, those are a couple of guys I think teams will be interested in later in the draft. Absolutely. Well, John, I appreciate you coming on, sharing your insight on some of these pass rushers. Uh, hopefully the Falcons will finally take one of these guys and, you know, it will be a while before you're, you're next on uh, Locked On Falcons to talk about, you know, these pass rushes, although, you know, yeah. knowing how history goes, it's probably <laughs> unlikely that's going to happen. But uh, let the people know sort of, you know, what you guys got going on at Pewter Report, what you're doing in the lead up to this 2022 draft. I'm just cramming, studying tape. There was so much uh, went on with the Bucks this offseason that I've just been so far behind on studying tape with all the other things we've had to deal with, obviously, with Brady and Arians and all this stuff. So I'm cramming this month. I'm watching as much as I can and trying to put out all the positional rankings I can. So hopefully my tight end rankings will be done very soon. Uh, hopefully they're up tomorrow on the site uh, so people can check those out. Uh, I put out uh, defensive tackle rankings uh, Tuesday or Wednesday. Uh, on the site so people can check those out there edge defender rankings have gone up wide out rankings so working my way through the position groups doing that kind of stuff you can check all that stuff out as it drops at pewterreport.com obviously and then i'll be continuing to work my way through the positions i'll have a mock and a big board and all that coming up in, in recent um in upcoming weeks i should say and then uh, yeah we'll be live for all three days of the draft doing some draft coverage as well so lots of good stuff happening at pewterreport.com obviously and then on twitter at ledyard nfl draft is where you can find me 
Well, John, again, I really appreciate you joining me on today's Locked on Falcons. And as I said, we'll probably be seeing each other uh, very soon, given how the Falcons' history of of not drafting edge rushers uh, has gone. But hopefully, hopefully, things are are changing for the better in the future. For sure. Thanks for having me, Aaron. I appreciate it. So, guys, that's going to do it for us here with John Ledger of uh, Pewter Report uh, talking edge rushers. We'll probably have some more insights into some of the other more uh, pass rushers as well uh, as, you know, the next week and a half before the draft unfolds uh, after this weekend um, and get some other additional thoughts on that. Obviously, we have some other great coverage for you coming next week. Of course, we got a mock draft Monday coming for you on Monday, and this will probably be my first and last attempt to project the seven rounds for the Falcons and, and give you guys a realistic draft um, that I think I could see the Falcons doing. Um, and then probably the last mock draft Monday, the week after that will just sort of be my projection of what the first 32 picks will be. Um, and um, yeah, that's, that's the plan uh, for, for right now. Maybe I, I change my mind over the weekend or something like that. But of course, if you want to hit me up for suggestions on future episodes, or you have feedback for past episodes or present episodes. And of course, by all means, hit me up on Twitter at Lockdown Falcons, Facebook at Lockdown Falcons. You can send an email to Lockdown Falcons at mail.com. And of course, you can leave a comment here on the Lockdown Falcons YouTube channel. Guys, I hope you have a great uh, weekend. I hope you have a happy Easter. Um, And so that's going to do it for us. Appreciate it. Till then.